All right, everybody. Thank you for your patience as we got our crowd here today. Um, thank you for your time today. My name is Mark Schaefer. I'm the project manager with INEMI for the Connector Reliability Test Recommendations Project. Um, just want to let everybody know that you're on mute, and if you have questions during the session, please type them into the chat window, and we'll be trying to monitor that uh, while it's going on and answer questions there. Uh, also, at the end of the call, any of the questions that we haven't gotten to during during the call, we will uh, ask them of the team. We do have most of the team here today, so that's great. Um, and I want to thank them for their time and efforts for the project for the past uh, several years, as well as uh, being here today to do this end of project webinar. Um, everybody, we will make the slides and the recording of this session available probably in a week or so. Um, and also to let you know the team is also working on a technical paper that will be published near the end of March, and we'll make sure that everybody that is registered for this session uh, knows when that is available to them. But right now, I just want to introduce Jeff Turan, who is the project leader from Amphenol, and you're all here to hear from him and the rest of the team. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, welcome everybody to our end of project uh, webinar. As Mark just said, it, it, it was an unusual project for my NEMI standards in that it actually is almost a three year long project uh, with some interruptions by COVID and other uh, difficulties. Uh, so they have a lot to cover at a very high level in this short amount of time uh, for the uh, project review today. Um, many more details will be included in the technical paper when it's uh, published. So the agenda for today is what Mark is showing now on the screen. Uh, we'll brief background and we'll uh, talk mostly about the SP3 socket and USB-C connector uh, that were uh, utilized as test vehicles in the uh, course of the project and uh, what we learned uh, about the project method, the testing methodology that we tried out using those test vehicles. Next slide, please, Mark. Uh, well, we'd like to start off by thanking everyone who participated in the project we're showing in the slide and also the next. The participants uh, and there were other participants from the country, uh, companies who participated in the uh, first maybe year, year and a half of the project who then traded off to the individuals on the screen now. But we had many valuable technical discussions and learned quite a lot from each other through the course of the project and I want to thank everyone in advance for their hard work. Next slide please Mark. And those are the logos for all the participating companies as well. Thank you Mark. Background. So this is the third project in, in the group of phase threes. Uh, third one. Um, the first project of several years ago, the phase one project, was initiated uh, and it uh, recognized that many of the standard test methodologies, qualification plans for connectors, uh, don't apply across the broad spectrum of uses of connectors and environments of connectors and all. So the phase one project team uh, worked on the recommending or worked on the development of interconnect levels, classifications of uh, connectors, and uh, some discussions and output regarding the testing approach to consider for those. The phase two project uh, was uh, their output was defining stress levels and specific test parameters or test conditions to use when evaluating connector degradation mechanisms. Um, the phase two project focused on connectors uh, in board to board applications and sub assembly to sub assembly interconnects, uh, often cable to boards. Uh, so the output of the phase two project was a uh, Test set of test schedules and test parameters to consider. And the recommendation uh, for 
a future project was to perform testing uh, according to the test schedules and the test parameters to validate the defined methodology. Both the phase one and phase two projects uh, still have a project page on the INIMI website and they have their output white papers and presentations available for anyone who would like to go back and uh, learn more about the, uh, the background of those uh, projects. Next slide, please, Mark. So the phase three project. The team had many early discussions about test vehicles to select for testing, the test methodologies to follow, and, and many other, uh, well, not characteristics, many other discussion, te technical discussions uh, prior to the beginning of any testing. The project team members decided to select uh, an SP3 socket connector. Uh, two reasons. One, it's uh, widely used in the market, very well known socket connector. Um, it has a very large available number of contacts, about 1920 contacts per connector. So it uh, provides a very uh, large set of data points um, during testing to provide good analysis uh, and output for us. The USB-C connector was also selected, but for a very different reason, and that's because there was concern by several of the member companies that they were seeing uh, wide variation in the robustness of USB-C connectors on the market and uh, often uh, were not satisfied with some of the connector performance that they were seeing and thought it may be interesting to subject the USB-C connectors to testing and see what we learned uh, from the output in the controlled approach. For the types of testing performed, the team decided to select temperature humidity cycling tests and also mix oil and gas corrosion tests, uh, both of which uh, were believed to be very suitable to uh, enhance or drive the degradation mechanisms in the, each of the uh, socket and connector performance uh, towards uh, reliability estimates. And that's the third key point uh, for the phase three project, of which there were many, many discussions. And that was to develop a, a kind of a new methodology for testing, uh, called the, the words here are novel approach to the testing sequences and, the, and all to allow reliability estimates to be calculated. So the intention of the testing and what I'll show in the screen coming up using the SP3 socket first is how the test sequences that are typically used for qualification of connectors is modified. The team also had separate discussions about preconditioning testing that's often performed with connector qualifications. Quite often it's a few cycles of mating and unmating and sometimes uh, a temperature life preconditioning to reduce the normal force to uh, kind of set up a connector, evaluate the performance of the connector, not brand new, but after a, a short time uh, out in, in the field and its end use equipment. The team decided to consider evaluating thermal shock as a preconditioning step uh, in one of the sequences to simulate transportation conditions, also dust in one of the other test sequences to simulate, uh, again, a little bit of age of the connectors and their use. Um, and finally, in this uh, last bullet dot on this slide, in the re, uh, to generate reliability estimates, uh, the plan was to continue the testing until 70% of the connectors or sockets under test failed 
the requirements, which were failed LOCR or low level contact resistance uh, measurements. Uh, and that intention was then to drive the collection of data and try and calculate uh, rely, uh, lifetime reliability. Next slide, please, Mark. And I think maybe the one after it for the SP3 socket. So this slide, you can see on the right hand side, a test sequence table that's typically followed for connector testing, socket testing. Uh, this is for the temperature humidity cycling test according to EIA 364 um, test method 31. And you'll see three test groups identified as 2-1 and 2-2 and 2-3. Typical of connector testing, there may or may not be preconditioning steps, but there are resistance measurements performed before, during, and after testing. And steps one through nine identify a very typical qualification set of tests. Um, you'll see the three different test groups. This is the variation in the preconditioning test uh, test to help give us some indication if the order of the preconditioning tests have any uh, measurable outcome on the performance of the, uh, in this case, the sockets. So I highlighted the colors just to more easily see the difference. On the right hand side, you'll see the word standard. And we're using that to separate what is uh, what are the typical steps for a connector qualification compared to down below steps 10 through 17, where we identically call this extended testing, or this is the repeated environmental testing to further stress the SP3 socket connectors and drive more contacts to failure to lead up to the 70% failure rate. And the intention is to repeat steps 10 through 17 um, as many times as is required to lead to 70% more or more of the contacts to fail, or excuse me, sockets to fail. Uh, there were 10 sockets uh, utilized for each of the test groups. So we had very large number of contacts under test. The temp humidity cycling was performed in blocks of 500 hours, and, and then a re contact resistance measurements were taken. And the parameters were the method seven in the 364-31 test of plus five centigrade to plus 85 centigrade temperature and humidity 80 to 98 percent level. And you can see below the uh, parameters in the table below for the mate on mate dust and thermal shock precondition conditions. Next slide, please, Mike. The uh, table here, the measurements, uh, because the uh, SP3 socket has so many contacts, 1920 per socket and uh, are measured. They're um, typical for sockets, they were daisy chained. Most of the chains were pairs of contacts. Uh, there were some chains that were quads or four contacts per chain. Uh, so you see in the table where it says 10 sockets per sample set, that's per test group, there were 19,200 contacts total in tests, 17,900 plus were pairs and the remainders were quads. Uh, the LOCR, low level contact resistance is calculated uh, by subtracting the PC board trace resistance for each of the chains and in setting up the test board, the Foxconn team who provided the sockets and performed all the testing for the project for SP3 sockets. They uh, defined, uh, designed the test board in a way that most of the measurement traces are similar in length to make it easy to calculate. The, uh, as a, not that it's 
exactly important uh, for this conversation, but you'll see in the technical paper that the rule we followed for both the socket connectors and the USB connectors are is that any low level resistance cal uh, measure that was over 1999 milliohms is considered an electrical open. That's really not meaningful in the data population, but interesting in evaluating the performance. The failure criteria that was used was that any contact over 50 milliohms max as a delta of the measure, measurement minus the initial measurement uh, was considered a quote failure. Um, so that's towards the 70% of the sockets uh, uh, failure rate that we were uh, looking to achieve. The figure at the bottom right is uh, just a brief uh, or a pictorial showing the uh, concept of the daisy chain set up and the uh, resistance test boards in the sockets. Next slide, please, Mark. So, Phil, if I may again turn this over to you, you are much better at explaining the, the failure rate concept we were looking to model. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Phil Conde and uh, I'm a reliability engineer at Dell. Um, so yeah, um, so this chart here basically is a summary of the test results. Um, and let me explain the table real quick. So on your left hand side, you will see it says sample set two, one, two, 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 three. That's basically the uh, uh, each one is a sample set of 10 sockets uh, and they are exposed to the test sequence two, one, two, two, and two, three. So that's what that means. At the top, you'll see uh, the word standard and extended, meaning uh, standard basically means the first pass. And it, we, we call it standard, even though it is not a standard EIA uh, test because we actually modify it by introduction of additional precondition uh, stresses. Um, but the notion is standard in the context of our, of our tests that it went uh, through the first pass. Um, and then the extended basically is repeating the main stressor via, you know, in this case, it would be temp humidity and, and the reseeding. Uh, the numbers that you're seeing is how many contact failures we encountered. So uh, during the standard test, for example, we had zero, zero failures. Uh, once we did that first cycle, we encountered on uh, two of the sample sets, a, a chain that, that failed. And then once we got onto the additional extended cycle, it just hit, hit the wall. We went into uh, you know, reliability terms, you, you basically went into a tear, uh, wear out. You, you basically uh, went into a hockey stick, you know, and it just hit that, that wall there. Um, so that's what each one of these numbers represent. Uh, and um, so one of the things uh, like uh, Jeff mentioned earlier is our intent when we started this was for us to collect time to failure data so that we would have, or we would, we could use uh, sophisticated or more sophisticated analysis tools like, uh, you know, probability plotting, Weibull, log normal, any of the other statistical tools that, that, that you, you know, are available for us to analyze this data. But unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, having only, you know, a couple of failures during the cycle and then hitting this quote unquote wall um, kind of precludes uh, you from doing a lot of that. And, and by the way, one of the desires for this extension was, you know, a, a lot of us go and do these qual tests and these EIA tests. And if you are a customer, you will be receiving a lot of test documents in which you basically get zero failure and zero failure statistics is a little bit tough because you said, well, it passed the qual, but you don't have a failure rate. So again, trying to trying to um, assess what would happen in time, particularly uh, you know if you went into an extent extension. And the idea was to use this mainly on, on 
connectors that you might use in a critical application. So anyway, that's that was the motivation. So so we got this data. Now what? So Mark, please. Next slide. So like I said earlier, we couldn't use Wible, we couldn't use uh, any of the other. So we just went back to the old and trusty binomial uh, approach. And if you've done binomial analyses, you, you know it's it's used extensively, even even through a lot of these more sophisticated tools. Um, for example, on a Wibel, the confidence bounds, you could do a binomial calculation and get confidence bounds. So, um, but in this case, you know, again, we decided to use the binomial analysis analyses. Uh, it is used extensively in MIL standard 105. So for those of you who are familiar with MIL standard 105, the whole standard is basically binomial analysis of, of, of different different types. But uh, basically what I did here is I created this plot and it's a plot for a sample set of 10. And on the left axis, vertical axis, you will see failure rate and on the right axis, you'll see probability of acceptance. So the way you use this chart is, let's say I'm a producer and I'm producing a product and then I submit it to a reliability test that mimics or simulates um, my field usage. And let's say that um, I was producing my product and it, it was yielding a 2% um, failure rate. It's failing this reliability test at, uh, you know, at a 2% failure rate. So basically what that tells you is if you're truly producing at 2%, if you went up uh, from the blue line at 2 at two percent, go all the way straight up to the purple line, that's the probability of acceptance. You will see that it looks to be around 80. Actually, the exact value is 81.7. So basically it tells you you have an 81.7 .7 chance of passing this test with a 2% failure rate. Um, and if you were to repeat the test many, many times, you will see that 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 would yield uh, th that, you, you know, 81 percent of the, the times you did the test, you would pass and then the other ones would fail. Um, likewise, by the way, you could do the reverse. If if I wanted to know if I if I if I if I did the test many times without knowing the failure rate and I had the 81.7, then I could surmise that the failure rate and estimate would be about it be about two percent. So this is this is how this works. Just kind of give you an idea. Uh, so next next chart, Mark. So with the the results we had, given that of the standard tests we had zero failures. You know, um, I basically looked at it and said, okay, well. You know, I wouldn't, I, we would not, if you're a producer, you would not be producing product that you would not have at least a 90% chance of passing an acceptance test. So that would yield a failure rate of about 1%. And the reason why it says uh, lambda less or equal is you had zero failures. So at worst, it would be 1%. It could be, it could be less, but at worst, it could be 1% and 90% 90 probability of acceptance uh, with with zero failures. Now, um, if you go to the extended cycle and you see that first extended cycle, you'll see that we had three sample sets, two of the sample sets had a failure, so those failed, but the third one didn't. So the third one had zero failures. So you get a 33% probability of acceptance um, based on that data. And if you go back again, probability of acceptance of 33%, you end up with a 10% failure rate. So uh, you're estimating that from step one to step two, you, you got about a 10x increase. It could be perhaps larger. You would have to repeat this test multiple times. But with the data we have, we're estimating about a 10x. And then by the time you hit the, the additional uh, extended cycle, like I said, we hit a wall, everything failed, nothing passed, so your acceptance is zero. Okay, next slide. So what are the conclusions, right? So if you pick your EIA or standard test to simulate your actual environment, 
and 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 you you this this test that you selected can actually adequately cover your your usage environment. We're expecting that fairly low failure rate. However, if if the product is used used in ex, in an extended um, in an extended uh, situation, or if you mis misjudge the qualification, you you will start seeing that the failure rate will start increasing. So, if you if you selected a qualification that's too short for the life of your product, what you're going to end up is seeing that the product failure rate is going to start creeping up uh, fairly quickly. And in this case, it's about 10, 10x, and you will start entering this wear out phase. Um, so uh, if that's the case, uh, you, you have a problem. All right, so and then let me let me hit the, the very last bullet in there. Our intent with varying the preconditions was to see if there was an effect. Of course, you know, with the results we got, we could not really discriminate between the sequences. It, it's it's very tough. We're talking about zero or one failure. And then all, all of a sudden everything fails. So we cannot validate um, an assumption that they're that they're different, and therefore um, the statistics and everything we've talked about here has the assumption that they're relatively the same. So uh, if you wanted to val check that, you you would have to repeat this multiple times, uh, quite a few times, in order to start getting enough data in order to do this discrimination. So anyway, that's uh, back to you, Jeff. Good, thank you, Phil. Appreciate your deep discussion of that. Uh, switching to the USB-C connector. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. We switch from what turned out to be an exceedingly robust connector with the SP3 socket to one that was not for USB-C. Uh, originally, we purchased and evaluated using a cabled board version of USB-C connectors. Uh, but we kept finding that the uh, many of the contacts weren't uh, available or weren't uh, measurable for low-level contact resistance. And a uh, little bit to our inexperience with cableized version connectors, they have um, active components in them. So instead of 24 contacts being available for low level contact resistance measurements, it's only eight contacts per connector. And that uh, was too small, a sample, uh, too small a number per connector requ would require too many connectors in test. Uh, to not be feasible to uh, go through the mix on gas corrosion testing that we wanted to perform. So we switched finally um, after about the fourth round to printed board connectors to uh, printed board bound connectors. And there are no active components in them. So all 24 contacts are available for resistance measurements. So again, with 10 connectors in each test group, then we we had a larger number of contacts available for uh, the data. Uh, the testing performed was mixed oil and gas corrosion per the EIA 364-65 standard. Instead of the class 2A testing, which these connectors were qualified for, they were 30 gold plated connectors, both halves, um, and quite robust in testing per a class 2A environment. The project team discussed and decided to try the class 3A exposure, uh, which is more severe, of course, and intended to help drive uh, the failure rate, you know, drive the sample populations up to the 70% failure rate we were looking to achieve. The exposure was the very typical 10-day unmated and 10-day mated uh, for USB-C connectors. I, I know there's another typical exposure, seven days made it, uh, but we did select a 20-day total test. 
And the table below in this slide uh, shows some of the preconditioning and, and some of the other test parameters, like the thermal disturb and the resistance measurements uh, parameters that we used. Next slide, Mike, please. So following the example of the SP3 socket, this is what the test schedule looks like. Uh, it's a little complicated because it's so long, so it's divided into two parts, reading left to right. Sample, uh, tests uh, 1 through 17 represent a typical standard qualification type test for the mixed oil and gas corrosion sequence where there's uh, some preconditioning, uh, again, often made on a few cycles of mating and unmating, uh, then with or without temperature life preconditioning. In this case, we added the thermal shock preconditioning. And what we did is we created two test groups. We changed the order two, two times uh, to, to see what the order or the change of preconditioning may uh, elicit in the final uh, analysis. And then the 10 days unmated, 10 days mated is performed in groups of five days then a resistance measurement, then another five days, then a resistance measurement, and so forth. Then a final reseeding, which is, uh, in this case, a physical made and unmade. So that's a very much a standard kind of test uh, for qualification of uh, connectors. The extended testing shown to the right is the concept of going through the 20-day MFG test uh, a second time or a third time and even a fourth time if, if that warranted to achieve the 70% failure rate. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Unfortunately, we found, much to our surprise, that we were starting to see some failures, some high contact resistance measurements after some of the temperature life preconditioning uh, testing, and then into the mixed oil and gas corrosion testing. Um, honestly, we were so surprised at the temperature life failures. Uh, we did pull out one connector of each test group to examine and perform failure analysis to see if we could determine what, what was going wrong. Uh, but we decided to continue to go into the MFG corrosion testing to see, did the failures continue? Did some of the failures go away, which can sometimes occur during the, due to the mate on mate that occurs during the gas corrosion testing for the contact resistance measurements and to see what, what the data showed us. When we examined the uh, one sample, well, when we examined the samples after temp life, we really didn't see any root cause uh, for the high resistance readings. Um, we were surprised that we couldn't really identify anything, um, but we, we couldn't find a demonstrable uh, root cause right after the temp life. As we continued testing and completed the mixed and gas corrosion testing, we were seeing just a very high number of contacts failed, kind of hitting the wall, as Phil said, after the first pass through the gas corrosion testing. We stopped the test, we pulled more samples for analysis, and the photographs on the right uh, show uh, are examples of two things we particularly noticed. On the bottom, it's a little bit hard to see, but we're trying to show with the blue arrow there that we we did see um, occasional cracked solder joint. Uh, we had one version of the connector was a straddle mount style contact connector. And we didn't see this uh, during the temp life testing, but we could uh, pick this up in the uh, after the gas corrosion testing was completed, but we don't know for sure exactly when it, uh, some of this might have occurred. Uh, more typical 
uh, and, and this is what we see with gas corrosion testing is um, the top photograph. The You see the three contacts. The longer contact in the middle has the red rectangular boxes. The lead in during the mating of the uh, connectors occurs from the right side to the left. And what we so what you see is corrosion product at the tip of the contact right where the mating would begin and that's the dark gray color material and you see it's uh, it's across the much of the surface there in that right rectangular long box and that's not unusual at all for class 3a gas corrosion testing where the corrosion product can creep along the surface and, and grow, if you will, along the surface. In the smaller middle box, a uh, smaller red box, sort of in the middle, you see that vertical line of, of grayish material. And that's the final resting location of the fully mated connector. What you see is corrosion product that's been carried up to that final mating location kind of snow plowed to that mating point and, and that's uh why we saw the uh, the failures with uh, the resistance measurements uh, as well when we cleaned off the uh, corrosion product in some of the contacts what we found was a plating crack right at the very tip of the contact where the it's insert molded with uh, into the uh, wafer the black wave plastic wafer. We saw that uh, on multiple contacts where the plating looked good, but there was in fact a crack in the plating right along the very tip that allowed the corrosion to occur. Unfortunately, as I as we wrote at the bottom, uh, these failures um, so early in the testing. Uh, lended some validity to the concern about the robustness of uh, the USB-C connectors overall, we felt. Next slide, please, Mark. So I have a couple of uh, conclusion slide and a lessons learned slide just specifically for the USB-C connectors. Uh, conclusion, now, as I said, we did not identify during our root cause failure analysis for the high temperature life samples, why we were seeing high resistance readings. After gas corrosion testing, we were clearly able to find some of the root causes of the failures. Certainly, uh, this led us to decide that maybe the class 3A test parameters were really too severe for the connectors, uh, and, and perhaps we should have selected the class 2A environmental testing instead. And maybe the same is for the SP3 connector at that final set of testing where it just hit the wall. We had the same problem with USB-C where there were just so many connectors that failed um, all at once that no statistical treatment of the uh, data set could be performed. Next slide, Mark, please. So lessons learned, um, check plating porosity uh, prior to testing. We were quite diligent, we thought, in checking the plating thicknesses and doing some close examination of the connectors prior to test, but we did not think to check the plating porosity. And uh, we feel confident that if we had, we would have identified that crack in the uh, lead-in point of the uh, contact blade. Uh, uh, what I had said before about uh, performed the same, in this case, MFG corrosion testing is what the connector was qualified for, in this case, the class 2A. I didn't speak to it now. We will discuss it in the technical paper. This kind of testing uh, involved a lot of connector handling, a lot of mating and unmating and resistance measurements. And at first, the first group of test boards, test PC boards we use for LLCR measurements weren't as robust as we thought they needed to be. And we did redesign uh, some of the test boards 
uh, to make them more robust, but it would be something to consider uh, in the future uh, if a lot of specimen handling will occur. Our lessons learned about the USB-C cable assemblies and the active components. And finally, the age-old concept of evaluating one unknown at a time. Uh, this will come up in one of the next slides, but we talked about at the end of the project, maybe we should have separated this evaluation of the preconditioning tests and the, the sequence of the preconditioning tests. Maybe we should have separated that from this idea of cycling through the environmental testing multiple times to achieve the failure rate. There we go, Mark, next slide. The conclusion overall, thank you. Uh, so certainly the SP3 socket is very robust uh, connector and uh, very suitable for its intended performance. Uh, but with the extended testing, the, uh, the uh, especially the third time through the environmental sequence, it, uh, its performance did drop uh, significantly. And the USB-C connectors. Uh, I reference here the class 2.0 uh, environment from uh, G2.0 from class uh, EIA 364, uh, where it caused us to select the class 3A level testing. It is something we'll talk more about in the technical paper as to uh, application class uh, selected for evaluation. But these connectors uh, we selected not maybe suitable for that. Next slide, please, Mark. We called the next slide the rest of the story. This is uh, the project. Uh, we thank the INME management for allowing us to continue. So the project team members wanted to try and learn more about the uh, our, our test methodology. We were delayed in uh, with the project in getting samples uh, and performing all of the testing we desired because of the COVID virus impacting the availability of the labs. The Amphenol and Foxconn labs, which provided testing, uh, of course, had to include the INEMI project team testing along with all of the other regular work they had. Uh, so we, we did lose some time as we were waiting for the availability of people and chambers uh, to perform the testing. And we had a couple of restarts. In the case of the SP3 socket, we did have some samples lost during testing that we had to get some new samples and restart testing. And with the USB-C, as I mentioned several times, we we started with several variations before we selected on the two PC board mount versions. So these all that just factored into the delay. Next slide, please, Mark. So our recommendations for a future project are very much to recreate this phase three project except take all our lessons learned about the selection of connectors, the types of sequences to run through with the preconditioning steps, uh, and consider that in setting up again uh, uh, an evaluation where we could determine if this methodology of the standard testing plus the extended testing could yield a reliability a methodology for reliability estimates of testing of connectors and in selecting board bond versions or cable mount versions maybe we evaluate the uh, maybe we perform the sample preparation in a way in the board design in a way that leads to much more robust terminations, solder joints, uh, to allow all the handling and measurements of the samples to be performed without causing uh, failures uh, from the testing. Last slide, I think, Mark. 
Uh, so again, on the uh, phase three project page, there will be a technical paper uh, summarizing everything we learned and all of some of the other activities of the project that uh, I didn't cover uh, today during the webinar. And really want to thank all the project team members for the deep technical discussions in the first few months of the project to define uh, what we would do, how we would do it, and what we would perform the testing with. Uh, thank the Infinol and Foxconn Labs for the testing they did. Uh, the Infinol and the John Deere Lab for helping with the failure analyses that was performed. And Dell and Nokia, uh, especially for the reliability engineering uh, support and discussions and planning, as well as the data analysis, and everybody. Uh, all of the companies for the technical discussions and, and Mark and the identity management just for supporting us in uh, getting through this this project activity. And that brings us to the end. So thank you for listening and happy to take any questions and the other project team members happy to answer any questions you might have. And if you think of questions afterwards, as certainly I often do, Mark uh, Schaefer included our email contact information for myself and for him. You could send questions to us. Uh, we'll share them with the project team members and be happy to come back to you with uh, answers as best we can. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, team, for your attention today. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I will. I guess first ask if there anybody on the project team or Grace, if you have any uh, anything you'd like to say at this point. Uh, now's your chance and then I will get uh, into the chat, the chat questions. All right. Yeah, no, sorry, if there are no questions, I would just like to thank thank uh, the team for uh, for this work. Um, I know as as they've outlined, there were a few um, delays along the way, um, both both things within our control and, and things that 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 uh, you know puzzled the team. But that that's research, and uh, I think the the result is um, very useful in terms of informing other other work that needs to to be done in terms of making our standards more more robust uh, in this area. So thank you all for your efforts and um, uh, and to presentation today. Thank you. Nope. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, thank um, you, Grace. We do have a couple of questions coming in. So Eric, I will uh, unmute you if that's OK, and I'll let you ask your your or I will I'll let you control your mic so you can unmute yourself. Um, and you may ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is Eric Fang from IBM. Uh, my question is, how do I get this uh, file? Uh, you post it somewhere or you send it out? How do I get it? Yeah, so everybody that's registered, so including yourself, uh, we will uh, send out a note when we post the presentation and the recording, and then we'll also send out another note when we uh, file the paper. So in about within the next few days, the presentation and the the recording will be made available to everybody. It'll also be posted online on our website, and then the paper uh, will be closer to the end of March. Um, so we'll, we'll send a note to you all because you, you'll get that as folks that registered for the session. OK, thank you. Yep. Yeah, yeah no. and I would would add uh, the earlier work is on the on the website already right. um, under the project page. So all of our projects that are uh, in execution or recently completed sort of in the last five years are um, usually there's a public page describing the project and any um, publicly available um, presentations, papers, et cetera, will be, will be uh, archived there as well. Yes. And one other point I, I can add uh, in this presentation file that we've prepared uh, Mark Schaefer inserted the hyperlinks to the project page and to the technical yeah. papers available, and I did try them out. They work beautifully. Yeah, and I'll make sure that when we convert this to a PDF, because we'll, we'll send this out as a PDF, that those hyperlinks are still active. Um, so, Jeff, there is a, another question in the chat window from uh, Aileen Allen um, asking is, in the SP3 test results, was there a statistically significant difference between the three preconditionings after the third round of testing? <laughs> or can you can we even say about that? Uh, 
No, I believe the answer is no, but let me ask Phil or Holly if they would answer that question to be sure. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you saw the values. I mean, you know, we have we had 19 uh, thousand chains and we're getting failures of, you know, 15 to just about the 19,000. I mean, it, it, it was so there were so many failures, you couldn't really really tell the difference basically uh i mean it's it, it, it's it's very tough again a, a extensive corrosion um it, you know you could probably try to argue that maybe there was a little bit less on two one but um th this is i mean you would have to repeat this many times like i said the, the data itself doesn't lend itself to be able to discriminate between between the different uh, sequences, and uh, if if that's important to you, uh, then what you would need is uh, you would need to repeat this many many times, um, and you know when I say many many times, you, th this could be calculated, but uh, but yeah, you know with this particular data set, we could not discriminate. Thank you, Phil. OK, we've got uh, five minutes. Any other questions from anyone? Use the raised hand or uh, type in the chat window. If not, I would ask that if you do have questions in the future, feel free to send uh, an email to me or Jeff if I can get that screen to show up um, and we'll we'll pass those to the team and get answers back to you. And um, like I said, within the next few days, we will send out a note with uh, links to the recording and to this presentation. And then at the end of the month, uh, end of end of March, uh, we should have the paper published as well. So thank you all. Thanks, team. I appreciate your attention today <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll do this again soon, right? <laughs> uh, we will. Mark, thank you for that. Yeah, no nice. worries. Thank you very much. Appreciate all your time. And uh, thank you, everyone. Ev everybody take care. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.